Let's look at the neutralization of a couple more oxy acids just so we make sure we have a good grip of this stuff. Let's take nitrous acid, HNO2. We'll draw its structure and then we'll show it being neutralized and we'll use ammonia this time. So nitrous acid, 1 plus 5 plus 12 electrons should be 18 valence electrons. How do we draw that? Well, it's an oxy acid. It has one acidic hydrogen, so we know that's bonded to oxygen, and all the oxygens are bonded to the nonmetal. So we have another oxygen, and it'll have to then be doubly bonded because it's only bonded to nitrogen. Let's put in the number of electrons we think every atom should have. Oxygen should own six and have eight in the valence shell. Oxygen should own 6 and have 8 in the valence shell. Nitrogen should own 5 and have 8 in the valence shell. And that looks correct because every atom is, has a formal charge of 0 and has a full octet or is isoelectronic with the nearest noble gas. So we have how many electrons? Bonding electrons, non-bonding electrons, valence electrons. Bonding is 2, 4, 6, 8. And non-bonding 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. We have 18 valence electrons and that's what we figured we should have. Good. So there's the correct structure of nitrous acid. The pKa of nitrous acid is said to be 3.2 which is about the same as hydrofluoric acid so it's moderately strong. I'm going to react it with, let's try, this time we use ammonia, which is a base. Not as strong as hydroxide, but it's still a base. So our base is the electron donor. What's the mechanism for this? The electron donor donates a pair of electrons to the hydrogen ion. And I say hydrogen ion because this hydrogen leaves its electrons behind with the oxygen. So our product will be ammonium ion. and nitrite anion, which has the structure of nitrous acid without the hydrogen ion on it. And this oxygen on the left has an extra pair of non-bonded electrons, and the charge is minus one. So that's ammonium nitrite. What's the pKb of nitrite ion? The pKb is 14 minus its pKa. The pKa was 3.2 for nitrous acid, so the pKb of nitrite ion would be 10.8. And for ammonium and ammonia, the pKb of ammonia 4.8, and therefore the pKa of ammonium ion will be 14 minus 4.8, and that'll be 9.2. What about the resonance structures for the nitrite ion? Can you draw those? So there's a negative charge on the oxygen on the left hand side. And that can be shared with the oxygen on the right. So let's draw a resonance structure with a negative charge on the oxygen on the right and the oxygen on the left becomes doubly bonded. So we're just sharing that negative charge among the available oxygens. There are no other resonance structures we can draw. There are only two oxygens that can share that charge. Let's draw the mechanism to show how resonance occurs. To make this singly bonded negative oxygen become a doubly bonded neutral oxygen, we simply need to move a pair of non-bonded electrons down to become a pi bond. To make this doubly bonded neutral oxygen become this singly bonded negative oxygen, we simply need to move a pi bond up to become a non-bonded pair of electrons. So those are all the resonance structures for the nitrite ion. Let's try one more. Let's take nitric acid 
that's HNO3, this time we'll react it with, let's do sodium hydride. What will it form? Well, hydride is the base. It's going to pick up the hydrogen cation. It's actually going to form hydrogen gas. And we'll have then sodium nitrate as the salt. Interesting. The pKa of nitric acid, it's considered a pretty strong acid. Negative 1.4. It's almost as strong as hydronium at negative 1.74. Look at the pKa of nitrous acid. It was only 3.2. The difference is approximately oh, 4 powers of 10, typically 10,000 times more acidic than nitrous acid. And why is that? Because it has an additional oxygen that can share the negative charge in the resonance structure. We'll be able to draw more resonance structures for nitrate than for nitrite. Let's draw the Lewis structures, and then we'll draw the acid-base mechanism. Now, be careful here. This is a little bit tricky. How do we draw the Lewis structure of an oxy acid? Well, it has one acidic hydrogen, so we know it's bonded to oxygen, and all of the oxygens are bonded to the nonmetal. So that means we'll have two more oxygens, like so. Now, oxygen likes to have double bonds, so let's give them double bonds and can stop right there. We got a problem, right? Do you see what the problem is? How many bonds are on nitrogen now? There's five. Can nitrogen have five bonds? No, it's a second period element. It never violates the octet rule. So one of these can't be a double bond. All we can do is have a maximum of four bonds on nitrogen. Let's put in the number of electrons we think each atom should have to keep them neutral and keep their valence shell full. This oxygen on the left owns six and has eight in the valence shell, and it's, it's quite happy. The oxygen on the lower right, give it two pairs, it'll own six electrons and have a full valence shell. But the oxygen up here, what are we going to do with it? How many electrons do we put on it? Well, if we have to choose between charge and valence, valence has priority. We're going to fill the valence shell, and that's always the case. It's the more stable state. So I've given oxygen three non-bonded pairs of electrons. It has a full valence shell of eight. But what's the charge on it now? Count the electrons that it owns. Two, four, six, and one is seven. This is a negatively charged oxygen. OK, so nitric acid has no charge, zero. OK, so what's going on? How can this be negative? Well, look at the nitrogen. How many electrons does it own? It only owns four. And so to be neutral, it would have to own 5. What's the charge on nitrogen? It's plus 1. Isn't that interesting? So nitric acid is a neutral compound, but within the compound, there's a permanent positive charge on the nitrogen and a permanent negative charge on one of the oxygens. It's a strong acid. Let's react with sodium hydride. This, remember, is ionic, even though the difference in electron negativity would not tell us that. Alkali metal hydrides are, in fact, ionic. Hydride is a Lewis base. It's a very powerful Lewis base. In fact, its pKb is negative 21. Maybe we'll look at that after. Let's get the mechanism. A pair of electrons from the base to the acidic hydrogen of the acid. Hydrogen leaves its pair of electrons behind, so it leaves as a hydrogen ion. That's the acid base mechanism. And what will that give us? Well, H minus and H plus make H2. I'll draw its Lewis structure. There it is, H2. Gas. And we'll have sodium ion, which is a spectator ion. We're left with a nitrate anion. So we have two oxygens with negative charges now. And recall, we still have the positive charge on the nitrogen cation. This is the structure of nitrate ion. What would be the pKb of nitrate ion? The pKb is equal to 14 minus the pKa of the conjugate acid. 14 minus a negative 1.4 would be positive 15.4. It's a very weak base, and it has to be so in order for nitric acid to be a very strong acid. In this reaction, Nitric acid 
has a conjugate base called nitrate whose pKb 15.4 sodium hydride is a very strong base and its conjugate acid is hydrogen what would be the pKa of hydrogen that doesn't sound like something we'd normally think of as being an acid pKb of sodium hydride negative 21 so the pKa let me write it down here the pKa will be equal to 14 minus the pKb what's 14 minus a negative 21 plus 35 so yes hydrogen gas although it's quite neutral can be considered an acid but it's got a really high pKa and that makes it a really weak acid and that's because sodium hydride is such a strong base and the only way sodium hydride can be so strong is if it has a really weak conjugate acid. Can you draw the resonance structures for the nitrate anion? Let's give it a go. Let's spread the charge over all three atoms. So at any given time one of the oxygens will be doubly bonded. Let's put the doubly bonded oxygen in the three different positions. I'll rotate it clockwise. Those are all the possible resonance structures of nitrate anion. In order to go from the first resonance structure to the second, notice that on the oxygen on the left has to get a pi bond and becomes neutral. That would occur by bringing this pair of electrons down to form a pi bond. Also note that the oxygen on the lower right goes from being doubly bonded neutral to singly bonded negative and that would occur by bringing one of these pi bonds down to the oxygen. How do we go from the second structure to the third? Note that the upper right oxygen goes from being singly bonded negative to doubly bonded neutral so let's bring a pair of electrons down to accommodate that. Note that the doubly bonded oxygen on the left becomes a singly bonded negative oxygen and we can accommodate that by bringing this pair up here. Note that in all of these structures we've preserved the full octet of all the atoms. They all have eight electrons. That has higher priority over charge. So an important generalization would be this. In general, the mechanism of an acid-base reaction we'll call an acid HA or H is a hydrogen and A is like any anion. That could be HCl, HBr, uh, HO, part of a part of an oxyacid, whatever it is, reacting with some base, and a base is an electron donor, so I'm drawing a pair of electrons. I'm going to say it's often negative charge. You'll see it's not always, but this is a good general garden variety, no name brand uh, formula for a base. What's the acid base mechanism? What have you learned from this? The base is the electron pair donor. It donates a pair of electrons to the hydrogen ion of the acid. And I say hydrogen ion. Why? Because it leaves behind this pair of electrons so it becomes a hydrogen ion. And what does that form? Think it through. This non-bonded pair of electrons becomes a shared pair to the hydrogen. Let me color them. So we'll give the base some green electrons and that forms that green pair of electrons that's being shared. What about the A, the anion? Well, it picks up a pair of electrons and forms the conjugate base of the acid. What's its charge? It's got to be negative. Please take a look at page 118, line bond structures of compounds with more than one central atom. Slide over to the right with me. Interesting. This is of high importance. Do your best to get a hold of it. It may take some practice, but it will come if you work at it.
we have drawn the structure of nitric acid. Here it is, HNO3. Turns out that when nitric acid is heated up to a high temperature, it actually dimerizes, combines into two molecules joining into one. It dehydrates and loses water. And what's formed is N2O5 dinitrogen pentoxide. So here's a molecule that has two central atoms. I say central because remember our rule, the least electronegative atom is central, and we know that the electronegativity of nitrogen is less than oxygen, right? So I'm saying it's central. So what happens here? Well, when the dehydration occurs, water is removed in one hydroxyl group from one nitric acid molecule with a hydrogen from another molecule is the water that's removed right here. The result is the central oxygen links the two nitrogen pieces together and we get this structure. This is N2O5 dinitrogen pentoxide. Now you see it's violated our rule about least electronegative atom being central. And this molecule is symmetrical. It looks like a butterfly. It's symmetrical around the oxygen. Symmetry. Interesting. A number of inorganic compounds have two or more central atoms. In many cases, the Lewis structures of such compounds have symmetry. And if symmetry cannot be obtained with the least electronegative atom central, a more electronegative atom, such as oxygen, may be the central atom. And thus, the demand for symmetry may on occasion take precedence over the rule that the least electronegative atom is central. If we were just given the formula N2O5 and asked to draw the structure, we'd probably have tried something like this. We try to keep the nitrogen central. And it's not correct. Turns out that if we take one of those oxygens and put it in the middle, this is the true structure. It has symmetry. It's not always the case, but it's often the case. It's often enough that it's worth learning this. I'm going to ask you to draw some structures here. I think hydrazine will be pretty obvious, but let's start here. Dithionic acid, H2S2O6 and it says that it's diprotic. That's good to know, so we know where the hydrogens are bonded. Now, this one looks pretty easy because it has an even number of oxygens and an even number of hydrogens, and the sulfur can therefore be central, and we simply distribute the oxygens and hydrogens appropriately. Let's try drawing that. Here's dithionic acid. It's diprotic, and that's good to know. It tells us that the acidic hydrogens are bonded to oxygen, and the oxygens are bonded to sulfur. Now I'm going to look for symmetry, so I'm going to put three oxygens on each side, and I guess that leaves sulfur in the middle, right? So two more oxygens to each side. That is symmetrical. Let's give oxygen the number of electrons we'd expect it to have. It should own six and have the eight in the valence shell to be neutral. We always try that first. And then we'll count up the electrons and see if we did it correctly. If we have bonding electrons plus non-bonding electrons, valence electrons, bonding electrons, I'll just take half, take the right side, one, two, three, four, five, six, the same on the left, that's 12, plus 1 in the middle is 13, times 2 is 26 bonding electrons. Non-bonding electrons, I have oxygens 3 on the right, 3 on the left, that's 6, times 4 is 24, for a grand total of 50 valence electrons. So I do have the right number of electrons. I've drawn every atom so that it is, has a formal charge of 0. The oxygens and hydrogens are isoelectronic with their nearest noble gas. Sulfur is hypervalent, but that's okay. That would be the correct structure of dithionic acid. It has symmetry about the center of the molecule. Let's try the next one. 
The next structure we're asked to draw is that for pyrosulfuric acid. It's quite similar to dithionic acid except it has one more oxygen. It gives us an uneven number of oxygen. There's seven. So I'm going to assume that symmetry takes precedence in my drawing because that's what we're studying. So let's put an oxygen in the middle and then we'll have the sulfurs on either side of that. Then we have six more oxygens, three for each sulfur, and two acidic protons. It is diprotic. It takes care of the acidic hydrogens. We need two more oxygens, and we're going to connect those with double bonds because they're only connected to sulfur. Let's give each atom the number of electrons it should have to be neutral. And I counted up here 56 valence electrons. It makes sense because pyrosulfuric acid has one more oxygen than dithionic acid, which had 50, so each oxygen brings six valence electrons to the table. So we'll have bonding electrons plus non-bonding electrons makes valence electrons. All right, bonding electrons. How many bonds do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven on the right, 7 on the left, 14 times 2, 28. Non-bonding electrons, let's count our oxygens, 1, 2, 3 on the right, another 3 on the left, 6, 1 in the middle, 7 oxygens, 7 times 4 is 28, which adds to 56, and we can see that is the right number. So we've given every element a formal charge of 0, We've given full octets to the oxygens and hydrogens. The sulfurs are, in fact, hypervalent, and that's OK. Now, pyrosulfuric acid, like dinitrogen pantoxide, is actually made by dehydration of an acid, sulfuric acid. And that's what the name implies. Pyro is heat and sulfuric acid. So heating sulfuric acid will produce it. Take a look at this diagram. So two molecules of sulfuric acid, when heated, will lose water. A hydroxyl from one of them, a hydrogen from the other, leaves the oxygen in the middle to link them together and we get this symmetrical pyrosulfuric acid molecule. Let's try the next one. Next we're asked to draw the structure of sodium pyrophosphate, Na4P2O7. Sometimes it's written as the tetrasodium salt. When you have the anion of an oxyacid, and particularly the anion of a polyprotic oxyacid, it's often helpful to draw the acid and then replace the hydrogens with the metal cation. And think of it as a neutralization reaction. You'll see what I mean here. Let's pretend for a minute that this had this formula H4P2O7, and let's say this was a tetraprotic acid. And if it was, then it's neutralized with, say, 4 moles of NaOH, you would then get this sodium pyrophosphate salt. And I think it's easier to draw the oxyacid if you're not sure how to begin, because we recall that acidic hydrogens are bonded to oxygen. That makes it a lot easier for us. We have seven oxygens, that means one will be central for symmetry, then we'll have three on each side. We have a total of four acidic hydrogens, two on each side. What would that look like? Let's put oxygen in the middle, a phosphorus on each side. Here's the symmetry. We have two acidic hydrogens on each phosphorus, like so. And then we have one more oxygen for each side. There's H4P2O7. Go ahead and give oxygens 
the number of bonds they should have and the number of non-bonded electrons they should have such that they have eight electrons in the valence shell and they're all neutral. That is called pyrophosphoric acid. Much the same way that we saw pyrosulfuric acid. So it kind of gives you a clue as to how it's formed. Does this look correct? I counted 42 electrons in the formula. We should count 42 in the structure. And I believe there is. So since we're asked to draw the tetrasodium salt from this tetraprotic acid, just think of this as reacting with 4 moles of sodium hydroxide. I won't draw every electron in here. I think we've drawn the Lewis structure of sodium hydroxide many times now. You appreciate the electron configuration of hydroxide. So each of these hydroxides will remove a hydrogen ion, a pair of electrons remaining behind. And that will give us the tetrasodium salt. And I'll go ahead and draw that one out. I'm going to release four moles of water on the neutralization. Give each oxygen the right number of electrons, such that they'll have a full valence shell. And they'll be neutral, except in the case of the oxygens which were deprotonated they, of course, will be negatively charged. Running out of space here. So that would be tetrasodium pyrophosphate. I have an image here from the lab notes in our experiment on phosphorus. There's a discussion of this important commercial industrial compound. Notice that phosphoric acid like sulfuric acid, can be heated to the point of dehydration, losing a water molecule, forming pyrophosphoric acid, H4P2O7. Notice that all four of these hydrogens are reasonably acidic, and then all four can be deprotonated or neutralized with sodium hydroxide, forming the sodium pyrophosphate salt. So this looks extremely complicated if you just look at it for the first time. But if you break it down in your thinking and work your way back, it's really not that bad with a bit of practice. Let's try the next one. Number five asks us to draw the structure of sodium tripolyphosphate, Na5P3O10. It's an important chemical commercially. It's added to detergents to bind calcium and magnesium and this would be the pentasodium salt of tripolyphosphoric acid, which means that these five sodiums, before they were neutralized, were actually hydrogens, and this was a pentaprotic acid. So to draw that, I'm going to take a little shortcut and just show you how that's derived. It seemed a bit tedious to ask you to draw it, so let me just show it to you here. So we start with three molecules of phosphoric acid, which on continued heating will dehydrate twice, producing this pentaprotic acid. It's got five acidic hydrogens on it, all of which are acidic enough that they could be removed with sodium hydroxide. And then that would produce the pentasodium salt, which is commercially sold. Again, this looks monstrous on the right, if you can work your way backwards in your thinking, it simply starts with phosphoric acid that's been dehydrated. And presumably these chains could grow longer and longer by continued heating. And you have a variety of chain lengths. There it is. So that's sodium tripolyphosphate. On page 114, there's a good summary that will help guide you in drawing the Lewis structures of molecules. And these are some rules that are listed in order of priority. So highest priority is the first rule. 
second period elements never exceed eight valence electrons. No exceptions to that. So what I mean by that is there's carbon with five bonds, not possible. Can't have more than eight valence electrons. No exceptions. Rule number two is that all atoms having no less than noble gas configuration. So that's a state of stability. Atoms having not less than eight electrons in the valence shell. With the exception of group 2A and 3A elements, beryllium, boron, and aluminum, those covalent compounds don't have enough electrons always to get to eight. Other than those two, it's a pretty good rule. So here's a, a very egregious example. Here's carbon with only three bonds in the valence shell. Clearly that's the wrong part of a structure. Rule number three says that atoms and molecules would have the lowest possible charge. We call that the electroneutrality principle. So again, there's an order of sequence, number one being the most important, and work our way down. What do I mean by this? Let me give you an example. I've seen in literature, in textbooks, particularly in textbooks that are made for introductory level. They've taught you the octet rule, and so they show this structure of sulfuric acid as you see on the left here. The proper structure is shown on the right. Every atom is neutral. That's the electroneutrality principle. But some textbooks like to show it like you see on the left, because they don't want to violate the octet rule, which they've taught the reader is unviolable. But in fact, we know that isn't true third, fourth, and fifth period elements can have more than eight electrons in the valence shell. They can be hypervalent, as we see on the right. So this has negative charges on the oxygen, positive charges on the sulfur. If that did exist, what simply would happen is the pair of electrons would move down here to neutralize the upper atom and reduce the sulfur charge to plus one. And the same would occur here. We'd wind up with the structure we see on the right. So that's the electroneutrality principle, is that molecules will naturally shuffle charges to get as low as possible because charges are a high energy state. It's activated. They naturally tend towards low energy, more stable situations. Rule number four, when charges do exist, the negative charges should be on the more electronegative atom and positive charges would be on the less electronegative atom. That's almost always the case. Right, in this example, we did encounter a situation where we drew the structure of hypochlorite ion. And we asked ourselves the question, could that rearrange in a resonance fashion to distribute the negative charge over more than one atom and stabilize it? And so you could postulate one of our rules of resonance is a non-bonded pair of electrons can become a pi bond if it stays attached to the same atom, giving rise to the structure on the right. And we were asking, could that happen? And I said, well, perhaps, but the problem is that oxygen is the more electronegative atom. Chlorine is less electronegative. So to have the negative charge on the less electronegative atom and the positive charge on the more electronegative atom is highly unlikely. So the contribution of this to the resonance structure is pretty much negligible. And that was rule number four. And finally, number five says having the same charge, like charges on two adjacent atoms, is particularly unstable and unlikely. Now, um, I had to stretch to try even think. I've never seen an example like that, but I fabricate one here. This is hydrogen peroxide, which, you know, it's already an odd compound. And if we used a really strong base, we could remove these very weakly acidic hydrogens, like so. So I'm just kind of making this up. It's a possibility. And if that happened, then we'd be left with a compound. Well, we're going to release two moles of BH, right, neutralized base, and we'll be left with this molecule. And both oxygens have negative charges and they're on adjacent atoms. I've never seen a case where that would happen. I don't think this is able to be done. So those are the rules that you would follow in drawing Lewis structures and you'll be in good stead. Let me give you an example of where this might apply. 
So you might be given a, a question like this and ask which of these structures is most stable. Now these you might see in different textbooks, sulfur trioxide, but only one of them is most likely and most stable. Now I'll tell you that you'll have to count the electrons, but when you do, they all have the correct number of electrons. Furthermore, the octet rule has not been violated for any of the oxygens, where that's rule number one, it's inviolable. Now in the last structure and the middle structure, we have more than eight electrons in the valence shell of sulfur, but remember that's okay, it's a third period element, it's hypervalent. So just looking at rules for electroneutrality would say, well, if this really existed, maybe because it absorbs some energy and go into a high energy state, it would very quickly relax and go back to the situation where this pi bond would move in, giving us the second structure, this would move in, and notice how the charges are all neutralized. The sulfur atom goes from plus two to plus one to zero. So certainly C is the most likely and most stable structure of sulfur trioxide, and that's the way we would normally draw it. There's an exercise for you here to draw stable resonance forms of carbonate ion and periodate ion and I think we already drew carbonate ion and we drew perchlorate which would be like periodate. So I'm going to stop here in this chapter. There are some other structures of rather unstable and strange compounds and I don't think we're going to have time for that this semester. So on page 115 and 116 and 117. Here's a number of structures I've given you and I'm asking you to find which one is the correct one, the right one. We are going to omit this this semester. There isn't really time. One would solve these using those five rules that we just went over. I want to remind you that solutions to all of the questions that are in this chapter are listed. In other words, I have structures for every question I've given you. So you could go through these to study for this. And this is probably a good spot to end chapter 3 on chemical bonding.